Uh, thank you for coming to today's Congressional Internet Caucus Academy panel. Um, this event is hosted in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus. Uh, the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus on the House side are Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Congresswoman Anna Hsu. And on the Senate side are Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. Uh, so we want to thank them for their support. Uh, we're excited for today's panel on uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act uh, and other privacy legislation, uh, both abroad and in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to our moderator today, uh, David McCabe from Axios. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm David McCabe. I'm a technology reporter for Axios. Uh, and I cover sort of the collision of policy with technology. Um, and we're really excited to be here. Uh, just quick introductions, um, starting going this way. We have Ariel Fox Johnson of uh, Common Sense Media. Then we have uh, Ryan Hig Higeman of the Niskanen Center, um, uh, which I'm always worried about mispronouncing, but I think I got all of the ends. <laughs> then we have Michelle Demoy of the Center for Democracy and Technology, and then Jordan Crenshaw with the U.S. Chamber's uh, Chamber Technology uh, Engagement Center. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly set the stage a little bit. We're talking about the new consumer privacy law that just passed in California. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this was a law uh, that came into effect or came came to be sort of as a result of a, a potential ballot measure. There was there was a, a chance that uh, California voters would vote on a consumer privacy. Uh, measure in November, uh, and essentially the, the sponsors, the supporters of that ballot measure said, "We'll pull it from the ballot, uh, or we won't. We won't get it on the ballot uh, if you pass this this bill by the filing deadline for the ballot." And so that that came to pass earlier this year. It was a pretty quick process, uh, at least uh, externally. It all seemed to come together very quickly. Uh, but the law doesn't go into effect for for several years. It goes into effect in 2020, which means uh, it could be altered in in upcoming legislative sessions. And I think many, in fact. Uh, think uh, that it will. Uh, obviously, the, the big picture here is that increasingly you have people around the world uh, and around the country articulating ideas about how consumer privacy should be regulated as, as these big platforms, these big web platforms come under pressure. So, of course, the biggest example of that is GDPR uh, in Europe, which just went into effect uh, and had been sort of uh, <laughs> cooking for several years rather than uh, um, the much shorter period of time in California. So you have this increasingly sort of splintered environment uh, in terms of consumer data privacy. And, and what we're going to talk about today is uh, sort of what these different measures do and, and what they are, uh, what they might mean, who they apply to, and then we'll talk about what it means for Congress, and then we'll take uh, questions. Uh, so I think uh, starting out, um, uh, Ariel, obviously uh, Common Sense Media was super involved in, in the crafting of this California bill. Uh, give us sort of the high-level 101 what it does for consumers. What rights does it give consumers over their data? Sure. And you know, Common Sense is one of the co-sponsors of this legislation, and we're excited that it's a great first step, and it's the first sort of broadly applicable. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. First broadly applicable consumer privacy law um, in this country. That's not just sectoral, not just financial, not just health. Uh, recognizes that personal information of all sorts um, should be protected, whether it's from kids or teens or adults. So a couple important rights that the California Consumer Privacy Act gives. Uh, it gives people the right to know what information is collected about them, including generally what sources it comes from, what the purpose of collection is, if the information is sold, what the purpose of the sale is, um, and also the sort of categories of third parties who the information might be sold or disclosed to. It gives people the right to access their information and to port it to a competing or another service if they want. It gives people the right to say no to the sale of their information, and uh, especially exciting for common sense because we're really focused on kids and families. If you're under 16, you have to say yes, or under 13, your parents have to say yes before your information will be sold. So it's an affirmative opt-in right for under 16-year-olds. Um, it gives people the right to uh, request that their information be deleted. Um, and it also provides protections against discrimination for people who are trying to exercise their privacy rights. So, uh, Michelle, how does this compare to the GDPR? Uh, and yeah, if our panelists could uh, remember to turn on the mic. How does this compare with the GDPR? Well, I I've heard, first of all, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Enjoy, I hope you enjoy your sandwiches. Um, so the 
a lot of, of what I've heard, there's sort of a rhetoric that surrounded the California bill that said it's the GDPR of California. And I think that's wrong. <laughs> I just want to state that, um, and, and you may have heard it too here. Um, it, it reflects and echoes some of the individual rights that are, that are in the GDPR, including access, deletion, and portability, but the way it spells them out is very different. Um, the GDPR has more meaningful fines. It's across a much larger base in terms of the EU. It also makes a distinction, distinction between data controllers and data processors, which is sort of a foundation that is, is not in the California law, but for reasons that I understand, it's, it's sort of California law already has the right to privacy um, enshrined, and there are provisions around that, so it wouldn't have made sense probably. But it also has um, provisions like um, doing an audit, doing a data risk assessment, things that are a little more granular and detailed, and um, I guess if you're a company, uh, more of a headache than, than what exists in the California law. There's some interesting parallels, though. I would say the California law, um, for example, the, the age thing, you know, 16. In GDPR, that actually varies by member state. So if you're a company, it's kind of, that's another giant headache um, to try to comply with different member state varying provisions as they relate to the GDPR. So you can be sued also in different member states for different provisions. Whereas the California law is much more um, broadly applicable, um, clearly, unless you count California in three states, which I guess is off the ballot now. <laughs> um, the other parts that are not like the GDPR, which I think is the opposite of what you asked, but is um, the definition of personal information is really broad. Um, I think the probably the authors were trying to capture the data ecosystem as it exists right now, which is incredibly difficult to capture in the idea of personal information. So it includes things like olfactory um, data, which is you know smell data, nose data. Um, it also talks about household data, which you know is really difficult to define. It sounds easy, but it's really not if you think about what that actually means, as opposed to personal information and how those two things go together. Um, the access and deletion rights are weakened in the California bill. So the access rights are in the California bill talk about the, you, you can get categories of information um, and it's about sort of the entities that have some data on you. So if you're a consumer and you think about what you want to access to eventually port probably or, or at least give yourself that possibility, it's really tricky to know what you can do with categories of information versus sort of everything they have on you, which is also not technically feasible for a company to do, not, nor really what you probably want. So the bill is trying to strike a balance there. Um, the other part is the deletion is significantly weakened also. It's not a deletion right, it's a right to request deletion and hope the company does it. Um, and so unfortunately that you know provision, while I think it's trying to give companies flexibility when it comes to deletion, th this is an incredibly difficult technical thing to do. Um, our data is splintered into a thousand pieces um, when companies get it. It's monetized in different ways, it's stored in different ways, and it's also not clear necessarily what your data is versus your data and someone else's. Think about an email. If I send you an email, is that yours or mine? Right, so that's a really simplistic way of thinking about how, how really complex this can get. But that said, this is not an affirmative right for somebody to delete. You can request it and the company can has lots of ways of denying it, um, and including just sort of operational uses type provisions. And, and, and we'll get in a little bit more, Sorry. I think. No, 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 <laughs> I if, if all really interesting stuff. I think we'll get in a little bit more to the places where the bill might be changed or where okay. uh, uh, where there might be more opportunities for stricter or, or less strict enforcement. I do I do want to quickly before we, uh, this is Jordan and, and Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, Ariel, walk us through a little bit why it's important or why, why Common Sense felt it was important to include measures specifically directed and opt-in measures, which are sort of the, the most significant <laughs> privacy guardrails uh, for teenagers. Yeah, well, I mean, Common Sense, and I think a lot of consumer advocates would love to see opt-in for everything and for everyone. Um, that was not sort of feasible mm -hmm. in this environment, and so we have opt-in for the most vulnerable, most tracked generation, which is our kids, and also teenagers. And the teenage piece is really important because while we have COPPA, uh, which is a federal law that protects privacy of kids under 13 and their personal information, uh, before this we had nothing protecting young teenagers, <coughs> and from our perspective, like being a 13 or 14 year old doesn't really make you that much more savvy about how companies might be using or selling um, your information or how you might be tracked and targeted across the web than you know when you were 12 and a half. So that's why it was really important for us to have 
opt in for this. And also, you know, we know that defaults are important, which mm -hmm. is one reason opt in for everyone would be great. But defaults being really important and it being hard for people to change defaults, we want the default for kids and, and young teens to be, you don't sell your information. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Ryan, you have called this bill a business destroyer. Why? Just so. Well, I don't know if I use those exact terms. Uh, I kind of get this bill in GDPR uh, mixed up in my head a little bit, but I do believe the phrase innovation death knell has been used on multiple <laughs> occasions. That seems, like, that seems like a one half dozen of the other six of the other. Yes. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, so I guess, and we can drill down into this more in detail as we go on and as interest demands, but sort of my broad-based concerns here with regards to uh, bills like what California just passed and rules and regulations like what were recently implemented in Europe is basically two just very broad general buckets. Uh, the first is that trade-offs, trade-offs between unseen and potentially unintended consequences really aren't given a great amount of weight and consideration in these bills. So for example, in the California bill, <coughs> the broad definition of personal information, the actually somewhat broad definition of business itself essentially scoops up potentially everything, right? And so one of the big problems here is that vague definitions that are included in, in these sorts of rules uh, aren't really being cognizant and I won't say respectful because I do think that people are aware of the fact that the digital economy is a not insignificant part of our daily lives and that it not only drives you know, new innovations and you know, new startups and new businesses, but it also drives job growth. It drives well-being for individuals and their families who are employed at firms who may or may not be, uh, or well, who may be directly or indirectly tied into this broader digital ecosystem, right? Um, but my concern with sort of like these broad, vague uh, inclusions in bills that try to just sort of cast a wide net um, and just try to rope in all potential harms without narrowing down into particularized, uh, contextualized harms that people are actually experiencing is that all of the unseen consequences of that basically don't get any sort of limelight or showtime, right? So the jobs lost, the potential innovations that are lost, which technically we'll never know about, right? after GDPR was actually implemented, and in fact in the weeks leading up to its effective date of implementation, a number of uh, startups in Europe just shuttered their doors. And it, you know, just, to, just to sort of give you the context of how dire that actually is for the European technology industry, of the top 25 global technology uh, firms, global, in the world, 15 of them uh, are in the United States. Three of them are in Europe. The difference between the total market capitalization of those sectors is U.S. approaching five trillion dollars, depending on what happens with Amazon or who's the first to reach a trillion. Um, the entirety of the top three uh, European tech firms amounts to about 285 billion dollars. Now just to put that into a slightly more narrow context, that is almost the market capitalization value of just IBM. So my big problem here is that vague standards, not taking account of the other trade-offs that we really do need to consider when we're essentially applying very potentially onerous, burdensome, and confusing rules to a wide swath of the economy. And, and Jordan, let's talk about who it applies to. Uh, how broadly does, let's, uh, I mean, GDPR, I think it's been reported, I mean, it applies fairly broadly. This has been sort of covered as it's rolled out. Uh, this California bill, uh, let's say it doesn't change at all. In 2020, who's affected? Is it just the big companies? Is it small companies and big companies? I mean, uh, I mean, this is not just online. I mean, this is every business in the country that, or every, let's put it this way, every business that does business in California that makes over $25 million in annual revenue. Um, I think that pretty much covers any large uh, company in the country, which effectively makes the California law a de facto privacy law for you know big businesses and, and big to mid-sized businesses across the country. Um, covers everyone from uh, the airline industry to um, you know the brick and mortar retailers, the online retailers. It's not just the social media platforms of the world. Um, and I think that's what's so concerning, I think, to us about what happened in California was that when you are bringing such a wide swath of industry into a privacy bill with you know, a bunch of terminology that has not been worked out um, through regular order and process, 
that's problematic when you're, you're essentially creating a privacy regulation for the rest of the country. Um, you know, I, I wish that, you know, we could see bills move in four days on the floor uh, here in D.C., but that just doesn't happen. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's telling um, from the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing when this was passed that the chairwoman of the committee basically said that she had grave concerns about the legislation and the process and having this ballot initiative essentially put a gun to the head of the California Assembly to get something done within four days. Uh, before the deadline passed to remove uh, the initiative from the ballot. Um, look, I mean, I think that, you know, there is a need for smart and good regulation, but, I mean, I think what we've seen from uh, what we saw in California was that we need to get things right and we need to do things from a good process perspective. It probably does, though, have to apply right across. I mean, it can't just be social media, right? Like, everybody uses data. I have an app for, like, the city bike share in New York because I used it once, now they have to measure it, right? I mean, it's not... It's, it's, it's pretty much every company other than there were some carve-outs. Um, you know, there was a GLBA, Graham Leach Bliley, for the financial institutions. Um, there was a carve-out for HIPAA as well, too, for the, for the health industry folks as well. Uh, but for the most part, this is, you know, I think everyone has focused this debate on the online world, and this actually now brings in everyone from the brick and mortars to, to the online social media platforms. Which, I mean, we think at Common Sense it's a good thing that it's including all of these um, companies and not making a distinction at least between like brick and mortar and online because all of these companies are collecting your data, selling your data um, and you might not, you might want to be able to tell an airline to stop selling your data or you might want to tell Macy's to stop selling your data. So. And the, this um, Massachusetts State AG just testified that most of the data breaches that they deal with are from small businesses. Right, so it's it, there's no we don't want to incentivize small businesses, which you know all of the big techs started that way, right? At least according to the, the mythology, um, as small startups. So we don't want to uh, sort of incentivize bad practices for small and mid-sized businesses. Also, I want to quickly actually though talk about the big companies because I uh, so I've read I've read the sort of key portions of the bill when it when it went through. Um, are Facebook and Google already in compliance with this? Or are there things that the bill would have them do for users that Facebook and Google don't already do? Who wants to answer? It's a sort of <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think every company and the nation is still reviewing what this law means to them. And I don't think we quite know yet what uh, implications this has for everyone. So I, I, don't, I think it's premature to answer that question at this point right now. I'll answer it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I think uh, the answer is no, they're not in compliance. Um, I think that's part of why they hate it so much. Um, it is, like I said, it's not, in fact, a GDPR for the U.S., um, where maybe they would have been more closely in compliance. But there are provisions, for example, uh, putting some kind of link on your home page for Californians that says, please do not sell my data. Now, does anybody in here not like that idea? <laughs> so. It reflects, you know, this public dissatisfaction with these, with the the way that our data is unexpectedly used and shared. Um, but you know, the companies like Google and Facebook and others have a legitimate concern about, you know, that property is hugely valuable. For example, think about the Google homepage, the search page. They're they're you know putting a button up there for California consumers is a pretty big deal, and I think for them also sort of makes an implication that they do things with data that they don't feel like they do. Um, so there's still a lot of time for some of these things to be worked out, and, and no doubt um, they will explain more clearly to us how they are not in compliance um, currently. <laughs> and I, I will say, I think Facebook, I mean, I know Facebook said that they supported the bill, that there wasn't perfect, but that they supported the bill. I, I don't think Google made a similar statement, but just for, for context. Uh, and of course, trade groups that represent Facebook and Google were, were much more aggressively uh, uh, questioning and skeptical of the bill. Um, uh, well, remember the reason, though, right? That they were facing the ballot initiative. Right. So the, that um, sort of was a gun to the head of a lot of companies who really, really disliked that, and mostly because it had a private right of action, right? So you could sue them. And they're already being sued left, right, and center. So that was a really big liability that they didn't want to take on. And so there, there's sort of a, they didn't, I don't, I don't know that they full-throatedly support the California bill, but they uh, supported it in relation to the initiative. I, yeah. I'll add one other difference, too, as to why I think a lot of industries viewed the bill as preferable to the, the ballot initiative was that 
The initiative itself basically said that the California Assembly had to develop a supermajority of 70 percent to amend what was in the ballot initiative. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm an attorney, but I hate to admit this. Whenever I get ballot initiatives that I, I look at or the, you know, amendments at the in Virginia when I'm voting, I say, yeah, it sounds like a good idea most of the time. I just go, yes. So, I mean, you know, I think that at least from a perspective of passing this law, it did enable the California Assembly to kind of have more of a robust debate about this issue and give it some more flexibility to amend things that actually might be friendlier and provide more certainty to both consumers and to uh, the business community. And just briefly on the private right of action, right, because my understanding is it shifted a little bit as the bill got closer to the finish line. Uh, Ariel, can you just quickly walk everyone through how the private right of action works now? Sure. I can do my best. So um, under the initiative, you had a private right of action for anything, mm -hmm. for any violation of the initiative. Under the current law, you have a private right of action for security breaches defined, I think, as like unauthorized access, exfiltration, um, theft, disclosure, mm -hmm. and it's security breaches of specific pieces of personal information, so more narrowly defined than personal information is otherwise defined in the bill. Um, would, common sense would prefer that it was more broadly defined, but that's, that's where you are. And uh, under this private right of action, you um, can get 100 to 750 dollars per violation, and you also have to uh, tell the attorney general you're bringing suit. And if the attorney general wants to bring the suit instead, and they're the ones who enforce the rest of the law, then they can do so. So it is a significantly more limited private right of action than was in the initiative. Um, on the flip side, you have more expanded consumer rights in the bill, like this new right of access to specific pieces of information, the right to port your information, um, and rights to request deletion. Um, you know, I've heard some complaints about the private right of action. You know, even though $100 doesn't sound like a lot of money, it could be a lot quickly when you multiply things. Um, I just saw that last month, I think, Equifax settled with the state attorney generals over its data breach, and do you know how much money it had to pay? <coughs> It paid nothing because it promised to do better. So I'm okay with the private right of action as it stands in the California law. Um, and before we before we uh, move on, I just want to kind of bottom line it for people. Uh, obviously, this is this is very possibly going to be amended in the next couple legislative sessions. Uh, I know everyone has multiple things they might tweak or change, uh, uh, but I'm going to ask you to make some hard choices. You have a magic wand. You can change one thing <laughs> before 2020. Uh, what is it? And we can just go down the line. To be perfectly honest, I would say that we need uniformity. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily with the California bill. I would say that we need to see um, you know, increased efforts here on the Hill to uh, create a uniform system uh, for privacy. And you know, I think that- There's got to be one thing, though, in the California bill, if it wasn't a federal bill. And we'll talk about a federal oh, bill. Sure. But um, you know, I would say, um, you know, in terms of the California bill, I think that there, there is one thing that concerns me is that um, businesses will now not be allowed to differentiate prices based off of using data. Um, I think that is concerning because of things like frequent flyer mile programs, uh, you know, loyalty programs like your CVS card or anything like that. You know, uh, you know, so if you opt out of having your data being uh, disclosed through sale or, you know, through the large, broad definition of sale and the, and the bill, um, you know, not being able to differentiate pricing, I think that's problematic because, I mean, A, I think the online ecosystem basically works through data. Um, and then also, um, you know, you're looking at loyalty programs, you're looking at frequent flyer programs. Um, I think that's concerning. And I think even though there is a provision that says you can provide a financial incentive to consumers, I still think we're going to get tangled up in court over what the, the meaning of value is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that provides uncertainty at this point right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that I wouldn't necessarily say we need to scrap everything there, but I think at the same time we need to take a better look uh, at, at that section right there. Mm -hmm. And I promise I'll give you the case. Sure. I'll give you the chance sure. to make the case for a federal bill. Sure. Michelle. Hmm. <laughs> In some ways, I wouldn't change anything because it's really brought um, the discussion of federal privacy legislation uh, to the forefront. But if given the chance, I think we would want to see some practices addressed that weren't in the bill. So things like deceptive interface design. So um, a good example would be uh, 
um, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica quiz that you, you know, may have taken. It was a personality quiz, but really it was about collecting lots of other data. Or the times when you see a tiny, tiny link that says, no thanks, but you can barely see it. Um, those types of interface design um, can create a lot of, of deception. We think also cross-device tracking isn't addressed, and that's when your TV and your phone are speaking, and I think that's very unexpected for most people. Um, device fingerprinting, um, looking at the idea. Sorry, what's device fingerprinting? For oh, okay. So device fingerprinting, it's just basically a way to identify your device, and so that could be your laptop or your phone or whatever, across multiple platforms and products and services. It's a technical identifier, ch basically. But it's a practice that follows you wherever you go. Um, so you can not even be using something, you can have shut down your phone, but it's still sort of like these footprints, footprints in the sand uh, that allow them to collect and use lots and lots of data about you, whether or not you're engaged with the product or service or not. So very unexpected stuff. Um, and this isn't something that's widespread necessarily, but it does go on. It's a, it's a part of the monetization of these of platforms, products, and services. And some of these practices you mentioned, it seems like are practices that may be emerging. No, 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 no. These aren't emerging. Mm -hmm. No, these are these are here. <laughs> um, the, you know, cross device tracking has been around for a couple of years now. Um, again, it's it's really unexpected, right? And so I think maybe some of what you're you're expressing is some of the surprise that a lot of people express. Um, but you know the difference is that more and more people are starting to get more devices in their homes that have the ability to communicate with other devices. So if you've ever had the experience where you turn on something and Netflix is, um, or some other service, Comcast or whatever, is, is showing you the kind of content it thinks you want to see and it's eerily similar to something that you played on your phone or something that you did, this is why that's occurring, right? So they're talking to each other. So I think some of those practices we would have liked to see addressed. Sure. Ryan, magic wand. Uh, well, I'd probably turn in the magic wand for a flamethrower and just kill the whole thing not with fire. That's not an option. <laughs> Elon, Mu Elon Musk has no sway here. <laughs> um, no, I, I would actually narrow in on the exact provision that, um, uh, that uh, Jordan narrowed in on, uh, which is 1798.125. Uh, so this is basically prohibiting any business um, offering, these offering services to uh, consumers uh, from denying consumers who choose to opt out of their data being collected. Can you not hear? Sorry. <laughs> Usually I'm pretty good at yelling at the mic from away. So <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, this is basically, I don't want to call it a non-discrimination clause. It's, it's a non-price uh, and quality on product differentiation uh, clause. Um, and it's terribly confusing and it's terribly muddled because it basically starts by saying, Businesses cannot discriminate against consumers because they exercise any of their rights in this bill, including these provisions. And then the next subsection starts with, nothing in this subdivision prohibits a business from charging a consumer a different price or rate. And the clause at the end uh, is the important part here, quote, if that difference is reasonably related to the value provided to the consumer by the consumer's data. There's no quantitative information on that at all. Behavioral and experimental economists have been well, mostly giving up recently trying to actually quantify the value of individual consumers' data. It's terribly complicated. So frankly, if I had a magic wand, just that whole provision, if I could get rid of one thing, I would just strike the whole thing. And Ariel, last, last act of magic. Um, similar to Michelle, I would like this to address some additional things more directly than it does. Mm -hmm. And for me, I would like, as the GDPR does, for this to address more directly uh, companies' own internal data use and collection and retention practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a great segue into the question of federal legislation, uh, right? So one one kind of prognostication is that the California bill just becomes a national model, that other states can take it up. Uh, but there is, I mean, it, we've seen all of you are on sort of different angles on this issue, and, and it seems like there is an appetite among the table here for some sort of federal legislation, not uniformly, but, but that there's, there's some interest. Um, uh, so because I made a promise, Jordan, why don't you, why don't you give us the, the quick case sure. for why there should be federal legislation? Well, I, I first of all, as a response to this. yeah, sure. I, I think there is no more inherently interstate industry than data or communications, other side maybe transportation. Um, you know, regulation of data belongs on the federal level as opposed to having a patchwork of 50 states. Um, you know, I think you know, when we're dealing with, yes, we have California today um, kind of enacting kind of de facto standards uh, for the country, 
uh, you know, I, I think that is now hindered uh, in a new era or brought in a new era where the era of self-regulation is over to an extent. And I think we now have to look at a solution on a federal level. I think if California has already started regulating, I think in the near term we'll start seeing states like Massachusetts, Illinois get involved here. And I think that from a consumer perspective and a company perspective, having a clear set of rules for the road is important to ensuring that customers know who to go to if if there is you know a, a violation of their privacy rights and also you know companies know which agencies to actually go to to actually get their uh, information on how to comply and, and they know who they can deal with and they can collaborate with with the agencies like the FTC to figure out ways to uh, you know you know encourage further compliance and and also uh, create certainty for the market and I think in the end when consumers have confidence and in clarity and uh, certainty, I think it, it, it really helps everyone in the long run. And Michelle, you're sort of on the other side of this issue, but you also said one nice thing about this California law is it encourages the potential for federal legislation. Yeah, th one of the more interesting thing about um, discussing this lately in public is hearing companies use my best lines. It's, it's like unnerving <laughs> to hear um, the call for this, but it's great. I mean, because uh, yes, we need a federal baseline privacy law in the United States. It is long overdue. We are the only Western democracy. I used to say us in Turkey, and then Turkey enacted one that doesn't have one. So granted, it's different in Turkey. But that said, I think it's super late, um, and we need it. So the question really becomes, what? how do we do it? Right? The devil's really, really in the details and what the approach is. So I can tell you what we think should be done. I, wa I want to get to that. Um, you just wanted me to say that. Just so sort of, we, we, we <laughs> No, I didn't want you to, but I, I want to get to the how. But first, I think, uh, uh, Ryan, you raise your hand saying, no, there should not be a prohibition oh, okay. on selling data. So. Uh, since I get the sense that you probably do not think that a federal law would not would be great, uh, can you walk us through kind of where you're coming from on the idea of a fe federal legislation? Sure. Well, so we can start high level and broad, or we could start bottom up and work our way up to broad. Let's I mean, there's do, a lot of issues. Let's, let's do broad. Let's okay, start broad. All right, so, yeah. so let's do broad, and I'll narrow in as, as much as I can in the time that I have. Um, one of the one of the fundamental presumptions um, with these calls for federal baseline privacy re regulation is that there is a problem to be solved. And I have yet to actually see what exactly the problem is. Now, I, I understand privacy comes up, people express concerns about it, but people tend to express real concerns about privacy matters that are important to them in very specific contexts in contexts where specific types of very sensitive information could get out there that they don't want to get out there. And quite frankly, the United States, I think, has the best privacy regulation uh, laws in the world because we are focused on sector by sector by sector. Different types of information used by different sectors in different ways implicate different harms for different people at different times in different contexts. Baseline federal privacy regulation, and this is, I want to go back to my original point here because I really want to emphasize this. Baseline federal privacy regulation doesn't necessarily get you greater privacy protections. It gets you a technological backwater like they have in Europe. It gets you fewer jobs, fewer innovation, less R&D. Uh, what it's not at all clear to me is whether or not you get greater privacy. Because rules like this, complex, convoluted, vague, who has the time, the manpower, and the resources to actually invest in compliance? And it is only compliance. It's not actually protecting consumer privacy. It's complying with the law as written, which is written vaguely. So compliance can mean different things to different people. So what you end up ha having is the big tech companies that a lot of people are worried about because they're collecting all of this data, you essentially give them entrenched monopoly positions forever because no innovative startups, no new entrants into the market can possibly comply with all the vague statutory requirements of these types of rules. So that would be broad strokes for me. So uh, uh, before we get to, so I think, right, we're now sort of understanding there's sort of different levels of, of, there's a spectrum here, right? You have the idea that maybe any sort of new legislation would impede innovation. Uh, and then and then on the other end, we've seen sort of the, the idea that, no, this is really needed. And, and it's sort of an area where the US has lagged behind. Can I address one thing that he yeah, talked about, which was the, that harms only occur in context, and that somehow makes them less I don't think that's true at all. I think I, I could sit here and list um, just the names of companies, and you probably know what I'm talking about. Venmo, right? Um, Equifax, Ashley Madison, 
um, grinder. I could go on, and, and, and we will, <laughs> and I'll, we'll send this to the Hill. But there are a lot of harms that are also societal harms, collective harms, things like anti-discrimination and ad targeting, right? These things are not, you know, off in the future. They're occurring now. And a lot of platforms don't want this to occur on their platforms either. Um, so the idea that there's somehow no harm, just because privacy is contextual, which is true, makes it tricky. It doesn't make it impossible or unworthy. We don't have a democracy unless we have privacy. There is no way that it functions without private space. And if you think about sort of broadly too, you know, some, I think Ariel mentioned our, the new generation coming up, we have to establish the value of privacy and set the expectation that this is something that is important to our society, right? So one of the ways you do that is you have a baseline. And when you don't have that, you have breaches. You have people's you know, information getting leaked. There's all kinds of examples. Target, I'm sure you all know the target pregnancy one. Um, so these aren't, just because they happen to different people in different contexts doesn't make them any less harmful. And, and uh, can I just, real quick? Because uh, I, to I totally agree. Real, real quick, quick, real, real quick. quick. No, I, I, I totally agree. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, my broad point here, and I think what I want people to walk away with is the recognition that privacy is but one value that we all value, right? There are other issues at play as well. There's economic growth, there is innovation. These things matter for well-being and for you know, earnings for people, right? There are jobs, opportunities. There's, there are many other things that we have to balance privacy with. And the question I think we really need to narrow in on is whether or not broad baseline privacy regulation is the way to go, or if what we have right now has been working pretty well for most people. And I, I, am, in the for, I am in the latter camp. But I, I totally agree, yes, yeah. Just because, yeah, privacy does matter in very in specific context for specific people, yes. And, and I said we'd get to how, so I wanna get to how. Uh, I think one thing that I, I hope the audience takes away is that there are, this is a really complicated issue. There's a lot of inputs into it and a lot of sort of like uh, uh, potential applications. I mean, all these companies you mentioned, uh, uh, I think were instantly recognizable to people, but the circumstances of all of those uh, privacy violations were varied. So, so how, uh, to, to the point I, I cut you off on before, how, how do you go about writing federal privacy legislation? What does it look like and how do you make it facile, or not facile, how do you make it ma sort of malleable enough to fit all of these cases? Sure, so I can tell you our process. Um, it was to, you know, we, we've advocated, CDT has advocated for baseline privacy legislation for a very long time, but in, in the sort of push in the last couple months, we first started with what is a reasonable expectation of privacy for any individual? What should you be allowed to expect in a transaction or in a kind of environment in the digital world? Um, and we came up with a couple values like agency and transparency and accountability as being core to whatever the bill, whatever the legislation looked like. From there, we convened different stakeholders to try to build a consensus. It's been incredibly difficult, but it's, it's important to do that, right? Something that people can live with and agree with. Everybody's unhappy, then you know you've succeeded. So we're talking about industry, academics, um, and advocates, and then you know, trade associations, UX designers, all kinds of sort of people who are stakeholders in this process, and the public. So the idea is, you know, how do we come to some kind of consensus? And the, the refrain that we heard from companies over and over again was that we want certainty and flexibility. And the problem with that is there's no legislation that does that, right? There's no legislation that gives you that flexibility unless you, do, you take the approach of giving the FTC rulemaking authority on data privacy and data protection. So that's the approach that we've taken. And I think it provides, it's not perfect, it's, it's certainly not perfect, but if what we did was say the, the FTC is a, an agency that has a lot of expertise in this area. They don't have the authority right now to do anything except ex post, which means after something's already happened. So we provide them with sort of clear limitations. I don't think any baseline privacy bill worth its salt does not have clear limitations on some kinds of uses. Unexpected sharing with third parties. The sharing of location, things that I mentioned before, biometric tracking, location tracking, things that you don't reasonably expect to be occurring. I don't think that a bill should duplicate the GDPR. I think it should draw from it some of the key elements that we think are good, like access, deletion, and portability. And I think it's really important to also kind of inject some conversation about discrimination. And what I mean by that is talking about different values attached to privacy. One, you know, We're talking about unfairness and what is just in the digital world, so putting transparency around ad targeting. You know, maybe it's not go after people, 
and companies who don't have a lot of guidance about how to avoid this, but create a framework that addresses it, that, ha that asks the agencies that are charged with enforcing our anti-discrimination laws to look at this space, right? To, you know, there's some discussions about an ad targeting database, that kind of thing. So I think, um, and at the bottom of it, there needs to be meaningful enforcement. There needs to be, the agency has to have enough resources, and it has to have the authority to actually have teeth in its consent decrees, for example. Um, not require just assessments, but have audits. It, there need to be actual fines that make sense. And I think to address some of the, the concerns about small and mid-sized businesses, that's where you can be reasonable about tiering some of the fines and having thresholds, right? The idea isn't that, I, I've heard a lot of people say the delis and laundromats of the world, but what about the delis and laundromats of the world? And you know, they are collecting data too. Right? They're using it too, um, and in fact may have less concern about the security, the privacy and security of it than they should. Um, so we think it should, so finally I would just say we, sh we think it should cover all sectors, including nonprofit sectors. We are not excluding ourselves from this law. And news? News, news outlets? Um, yeah, sure. To the extent that you aren't, we're not talking about your First Amendment activities, right, but your commerce activities, yeah. Uh, and Ariel, you were nodding throughout a bunch of that. What, w is there anything you would add in terms of what you'd like to see in a bill uh, if Congress can get it together? To I mean, <laughs> we'd love it if Congress could get it together and have a strong uh, privacy bill and be, we'd be happy to have a strong standard for America. I mean, I think we think it's really important, whatever we do, to recognize uh, kids and teens and their special vulnerabilities. and if everything is super strong for everyone, then we don't need special rights for kids and teens. But if we're starting to waver on certain rights for adults, then we would want to ensure that kids and teens are, are the most protected, both in terms of you know things like user design that Michelle was talking about, and in terms of things like notice and understanding and expectations. I mean, they have different expectations and different comprehension levels than adults do. And our comprehension level as adults isn't super high all the time, so we think we need to particularly watch out for them. And, and uh, Jordan, before we uh, head to audience questions, um, how far sh would you like to see a federal bill go in preempting state rules? Is there anything that would be left to the states? <laughs> 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 well, I, I think that there is some discussion to be had about that. And, and the chamber is actually leading an effort of industry to develop privacy principles. And I couldn't agree wor more with Michelle on the, the need for consensus across the board, you know, amongst, um, you know, industry groups as well as, you know, citizen groups. Um, you know, so we have developed, um, you know, a privacy principles working group with industries um, ranging from health to telecommunications to retailers. Um, our, our president and CEO, Tom Donahue, was quoted in Politico, I think about two weeks ago, um, saying that we are developing privacy principles uh, with the hope of seeing some form of, of, of federal fix. Um, so we think consensus is important. We think getting input from, um, you know, outside groups is important. We're working with policymakers right now about what that might look like. Um, in terms of what is preempted, I think that in the long run, I think uh, the more we have the federal government involved uh, with this data issue, the better than the states creating a patchwork. Uh, I think there are important things to talk about, like transparency and, and providing uh, consent based on, on sensitivity of data. I think there are are, are still conversations going on. But this is what I like about this conversation here in, in D.C. is that we have time and I think there's a willingness now to get something done uh, as opposed to kind of rushing something through in a four-day period. And I think we can have a good, robust conversation about what privacy looks like. And I think, you know, we've got a year before implementation of the California bill um, on January 1st, 2020. So I think, you know, this is a, a kind of the right time for us to be talking about this issue and really making sure we get privacy right on a federal level. So, uh, been on this beat for a long time. People generally publicly like to be very optimistic, but just to be realists here for a second, who here at this table thinks that Congress will get a federal privacy bill done before January 1st, 2020? Before January 1st? Like it's not, said oh, 2020. Oh, 2020, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do then, sorry. I you think it's so 2018. Well, I mean, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I'm sort of idealistic. I, I, I don't know that the bill will look like I would hope in my um, fevered imagination, but I think it's possible that there will be elements of protection that get put into play. And in fact, the bill that we are writing, we've designed it so that parts of it could be broken out and still stand as protection. Mm -hmm. 
so now uh, uh, we've all talked a lot. Uh, I'd love to open the floor up to questions. Um, and we'll, we'll, uh, I will. uh, yeah, we'll repeat the question. So, uh, to make sure people are here. And so, uh, yeah, if you want to collect their thoughts, we can start over there. And, and I would just say, uh, uh, I've covered a lot of these panels. The more the questions can be questions rather than comments, the better for everybody involved. Well, so uh, to start, the uh, definition of personal information is broad enough that it essentially includes, it could theoretically include all information, like everything, just everything, including aggregate information. Yeah, the de-identified information is, yes. Well, the, the definition of aggregated is, I, I actually have to go back to my notes there because I remember making a comment about that somewhere. This is a 10,000 word bill, so I had a lot of notes, sorry. You might be, you, you might, you, you might be right. Well, and, and the question is, I understand, so how do you deal with that when that's what a lot of companies uh, use? So the question is, what is the harm in the case of aggregate data? Okay. Well, so so there's lots of examples. There, there, I, I don't have a lot of examples just off the top of my head, but you know, data is fed into all sorts of other you know product offerings that companies develop, right? So uh, you know, Google uh, makes most of their money on, uh, you know, advertising revenue. Um, that money gets shifted around to go into, you know, new moonshot projects that, you know, could potentially see autonomous vehicles on the streets. That goes into Google Loon to provide, uh, you know, uh, 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 internet access to underserved rural communities. So my, my, my point on the personal information definition and also the business definition um, is that when you start to broaden those definitions in such a way that you scoop up more and more and more things without actually narrowing in on a very particular problem that you're trying to solve with regulation, the floodgates are open for all sorts of who knows what to happen. Unintended consequences, uh, you, uh, you know, by, by, by forcing an opt-in requirement, you actually increase the transaction cost of individuals handing over data, which I will not say is the oil of the digital economy because that's a misnomer, but it does help fuel the digital economy. So you're you're replacing, um, you're replacing an artificial tax where there wasn't one previously in order to address a problem that isn't clearly specified to begin with. Uh, just real quick, my, my broader concern with the California bill in particular, I mean, I'll talk all day about GDPR, but it's across an ocean for now. Um, my broader concern with the California bill in particular is that provision that I mentioned, 1798.125, which is basically just a, a free rider provision. So if you opt not to uh, hand over your data, I put quotes around your because that's a complicated conversation that I don't really want to get too deep into because it leads us down the rabbit hole of philosophy. <laughs> um, but if you opt not to hand over uh, data to the company, you still get the same services as everyone else. So there's no incentive for anyone not to hand over data. And that's when you start to see a ripple effect in the digital economy that does start to impact jobs. and future opportunities and wages and just hundreds of thousands, upwards of 10 million people are directly or indirectly tied into the digital economy. Um, you know, those are real people who have lives that they live every day and it might not seem like that because the internet is so abstract, right? But the things that we do in Washington, the things that they do in Sacramento have a real world impact on those people and their ability to live day to day. Uh, I saw a question over there and then we'll Uh, 
and the question was, uh, I'm just repeating the question for people in the back, uh, what are the pros and cons of lifting just the prohibition on tort litigation against the companies for misusing third-party data? Anyone want to? So is that basically the why not let the common law deal with it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, de I'll defer. <laughs> Jordan, you did, oh, Michelle, you want to <laughs> jump on the grenade? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there are, there are merits to that idea, um, including the extreme um, speed with which companies would completely change <laughs> their approach to all of this and um, likely put privacy as the number one priority um, in security. I, I do think, though, you know, I think that the way that regulation has occurred now represents a market failure. Um, to open up litigation, while it would give individuals the right to, to bring suit, and I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing, it also creates a situation where companies are spending most of their time fighting lawsuits, spending a lot of money to defend themselves, and it's not clear what those remedies really are, right? It's um, it's one of the one of the issues actually in the California bill. I think is the private the limited private right of action includes a right to cure with companies. So the company say there's a data breach, you can go to them and they have a certain amount of time, like 30 days or something, to cure. And but how how do you do that, right? How do you cure that violation? Um, and similarly, what is the remedy beyond money um, for that? So I like the idea of the incentive, <laughs> the sort of push there, um, but I think the reality may not actually end up protecting people, and those types of suits leave a lot of holes, right? It's, it's really just dependent on who, can, who decides they can represent an issue at a certain time, at a certain place, um, who has the money to bring suit. So I'm not sure that it would cover all of the issues that we care about, including discrimination issues. And are the courts prepared, would the courts even be prepared to hear suits on some of these issues? I mean, they're pretty technically complex, and sometimes courts have struggled to wrap their head around some of the stuff. No, I think that's a fair point. Yeah, I th it really, I think it, I wouldn't generalize all of the courts like that. There are judges who have really tried to learn a lot about technology. But yeah, I mean, there are plenty of advocates who don't understand a lot of technologies. Um, so I think that's a fair point that it would, it, and you could end up with some really crazy decisions that, like I said, wouldn't necessarily move things forward. That's why baseline is so appealing. Um, it's sort of everybody has the same rules. Everybody has to abide by the same rules. You're not opening the companies up to a huge amount of liability, but accountability is different. And just to repeat the question for people in the back and flag if I get it wrong, uh, uh, the question is part of the bill sort of triggers the potential creation of regulation, some around IP, how would those affect the bill as it moves towards enactment? And Ariel, do you want to maybe? Yeah, sure. So I don't think that the regulations are going to, you know, change the law, but I think they are going to help implement it and clarify things. And as, as noted here and many times elsewhere, uh, this occurred pretty quickly. Um, so it will be helpful to have the thoughtful regulatory rulemaking process at the, with the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the things you're, you're raising are things that, you know, when we spoke with industry, they were concerned about. You know, consumers have a right to request information. What does that mean? What if it's a trade secret? What if it's protected intellectual property? And so having those exceptions being made clear and having the Attorney General have authority to, to do stuff and to make sure that 
things that are protected or need to be protected stay protected is something in the bill. And I think this also speaks to the earlier point made about how if you have a baseline federal law, it'd be really helpful to have the FTC go through a rulemaking and help put out specific guidance. And that allows them to both keep the um, rules up to date as technology is changing faster than, than Congress could. And we're hopeful that the same thing will happen here in California. Uh, so we have time, I think, for one more question, uh, as long as it's quick. Uh, and I see a hand <laughs> in the back. Question was the impact of smart toys on kids and teens. Sure. Um, well, so I guess one thing I note about smart toys is they have been the subject of various data breaches and hacks over the last couple of years. And one um, reason that I said I wished that this security breach language protected more personal information than it does is because a lot of the information um, that's hacked in this stuff, like personal conversations a parent might have with their kid or messages back and forth. Um, is not protected under the sort of current data breach structure. Uh, Common Sense is supporting another bill, an Internet of Things reasonable security bill in California. Um, but that just goes to show, I think Smart Toys goes to show how there's a lot of really sensitive information being collected about people from bedrooms and from kitchens that might not be being accurately protected in the law right now. And uh, I think uh, we're pretty much at time, so I think we're going to call it there. But before we go, uh, if you want to go down the line and you want to tell the crowd, you plug your Twitter handle, so the website of your organization, where people can find out more about where your group stands or you stand on some of these issues, and they can kind of track the conversation as it continues. So we can start at the end. Or Yeah, um, I, I would say um, uh, CTEC's website, um, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a good place to look as well. Um, also, um, Tech Innovation is the Twitter handle uh, that we have for CTEC at the Chamber. And, you know, I'm, I'll be here, too, if you want to reach out to me um, and chat about privacy. Uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, you can check out our work at cdt.org. Um, we are on the Hill frequently now these days, too, so happy to, to meet with people and answer questions about the legislation we're drafting. Um, the Privacy and Data Project has a specific tab on our homepage that you can look at, and our Twitter handle is sendemtech. Send and if you don't get that right, you end up with like a Chinese um, newspaper. So make sure it's send them tech. Uh, you can find all of the work that I do personally at the Niskanen Center website, niskanencenter.org. Um, but I'm also just going to throw out a plug for my good friends over at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation because they do spectacular work on all of these issues. So I, I really urge you to check them out as well. You can find all of Common Sense Media's resources at commonsense.org, and our policy arm is Common Sense Kids Action, which you can get to from there, or the Twitter handle is at CS Kids Action. And you can sign up for all the Axios newsletters by giving us just one piece of personal information, your email at signup.axios.com. Let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you.